Just two days ago, the Labour leader said his flagship plan to spend £28 billion a year on green investment was what the country desperately needed. Tonight, he's ditched it. Will voters believe any of Keir Starmer's promises now? To discuss that and more, we're in the Labour stronghold of Nottingham, the second biggest city in the East Midlands. But our audience here, as always, is a reflection of the electoral picture across the nation. They also want to ask, is dentistry in crisis? Should we all be investing in a personal set of pliers? Should under-16s be banned from social media apps? And after the horrific attack in London on a woman and her two children, should sex offenders ever be granted asylum? Welcome to Question Time. From the Conservatives, the shiny new deputy chair of the party appointed this week, James Daly. He's also the holder of the most marginal seat in England, Bury North, which he won by just over 100 votes. Wes Streeting is Labour's shadow secretary for health and social care. And at 41, he's already published his life story called One Boy, Two Bills and a Fry Up, a memoir of growing up and getting on. Daisy Cooper is deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats, who now have 15 MPs. She also doubles up as her party's spokesperson on health. Inaya Falaran Iman is a former Brexit party candidate and founder of the Equiano Project. That's an ideas forum about culture, race, politics and freedom of speech. She's also a contributing editor at the Daily Mail. And making his Question Time debut, Paddy McGuinness, who rose to fame playing a useless nightclub bouncer in hit comedy Phoenix nights. He's since presented popular shows such as Take Me Out, Top Gear and A Question of Sport. This year he'll front a new series of Inside the Factory. Welcome to our panellists, welcome to our audience here in Nottingham, great to see you and of course welcome to you at home. You can catch the programme on BBC Sounds or on iPlayer and of course there's always a pretty lively debate going on on social media as well. Right, let's take our first question tonight. There's a lot been happening in the last 24 hours, don't know if you've noticed. Kevin Carty, where are you? With Labour ditching their flagship promise to spend £28 billion a year on green investment, can we believe anything they say or pledge? Right, Wes. You're up. What's the answer to that question? It's actually because we're making difficult choices and because we're being honest about the fact we can't afford to do all the things we would like to do, that you should place even greater trust and greater confidence that the manifesto you'll see from Labour at the election is one that can be delivered and one that can be afforded. It is no secret that since we made that £28 billion announcement in 2021, the economy has changed for the worse, the cost of borrowing has quadrupled, and that is in no small part thanks to the disastrous mini-budget, which has not only trashed the nation's finances, it means that families across the country are having to make even harder choices than we are as politicians, like the parents who are having to put essentials back on the shelves in the supermarkets because they can't afford them because the prices have gone up, like the families who are having to tell their kids that this summer there won't be the holiday abroad because the mortgage has gone up, because the rent's gone up. So we make no apology, actually, for the fact that we've had to take a long, hard look at the challenges facing the country, the promises we would like to make, and kick the tyres on every single one of them to ask those two questions. Can we deliver it? Can the country afford it? And if the answer to either of those questions is no, it ain't going in our manifesto. The alternative is where we've been before, frankly, where we've been over the last 14 years, which is promises made in elections, subsequently broken. And if there's one thing that's in even shorter supply in our country than money at the moment, it's trust in politics and politicians. So the challenge for the next Labour government, if we win the next election, is to rebuild the public finances and your family's finances, to rebuild our country and our public services, but also to rebuild trust in politics. And that is why we have had to look at our manifesto commitments very carefully and all of the policy ideas that are floating around and make sure that we can go into the election and look you in the eye and say every pledge we've made is a pledge that we can deliver and a pledge that a country can afford. And I think that's the right thing to do and I'd rather get hard time now than let you down after the election. So, obviously, this announcement was just made today by, uh, by the Labour leader. Explain this to me, then. If... It, if in order to fulfil the green investment plan, it was originally thought £28 billion a year was needed, and now it's going to be £5 billion a year. 
Was it a wild overestimate originally, or is it a wild underestimate now? Because the difference between those two figures is enormous. No, I, I think it was, it was always ambitious, and, and that was... That was made clear when we first made the announcement in 2021 and through the conversations we've, we've had since. But where we've landed today is, is in a place where we can say we've got a plan that would cut bills for families in terms of energy bills, that would help get the economy growing and create jobs in part of the country where we've seen, frankly, industry pack up and leave but how over can the decades. You, how can you do what Kirstan was saying he'd do today, which is pretty much everything he was planning to do originally, but on a fifth of the money. Well, hang on. The, the commitment to clean power by 2030, which is the, one of Labour's five missions for government, we've made a whole series of commitments on that fully costed, fully funded, and those commitments remain. There were lots of other things that we would have liked to have done in addition that would take us well beyond the £23.7 billion we've committed to spend in total over five years. And it's those things that internally, in the manifesto process, we've had to say to colleagues... No, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to do that. And that's not easy, it's, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's actually a lot easier for us as politicians making those choices than it is families that are making even harder choices for themselves at the moment. And we're not willing to, willing to gamble with your money and the nation's economy in the way the Conservatives have, which has left the whole country paying a very, very heavy price indeed. James. Well, on 311 occasions, Labour Party politicians have said they are going to go ahead with their green £28 billion uh, revolution of the economy, as they described it. On over 60 occasions, Keir Starmer has U-turned. I'll just have to say that again. On 60 occasions, he has U-turned. So, when Wes talks about promises made and promises broken, well, that's a U-turn, isn't it? And he's done it on over 60 occasions. Now, I can understand a political party, you, and qu quite rightly, you are good, well, hopefully you're going to do I'm sure I'll be challenged in, in terms of something in respect to my party, but I can understand putting a manifesto to a country where you actually believe in something. But just putting something out there, then having you turn because it doesn't seem popular, that's not what a government is about. And what is quite obvious and what is quite simple is that there is no plan from Keir Starber's Labour Party. They will say anything, he will say, in terms of addressing the question, he will say anything to get your vote. And in terms of this plan, in terms of the issues we've been talking about, about his financing, well, let's all come back next week because he'll have U-turned by next week because this is what he continually does. So if you want a party that has a plan, that has a plan for this country, that has five pledges, which we are asking you as the Conservative Party to judge us on, broken please them. vote for the Conservative Party. Do not vote for a person who you all know I can understand why some people in the will vote Labour come what may, but you all know you cannot take a word he says seriously because he will, he will U-turn immediately in respect of that. Okay. No plan, high taxes, disaster. All right, lots of hands have shot up. Let's hear from some of you. The woman there in the stripy scarf. I'm pleased to hear that it's um, more of a realistic figure, but, it, but then there is the question, a bit like Fiona said, is it going to be enough money to actually meet the needs of society. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take a few points and I'm sure you'll come back to you, Wes. Right. Man there in the glasses, yeah, and the grey sweater. So, the Conservatives said they would level up. The disparities have got worse. They said they would eliminate rough sleeping by 2024. It's up by 50% since 2021. They said they would deliver HS2 in full. We're going to get a shuttle service between Birmingham and somewhere called Old Oak Common that no-one's ever heard of. If Labour are not going to spend £28 billion a year on this, I'd much rather know about it now than discover after the election that they didn't really mean what they said. Okay. And further back, the man in their glasses with the dark blue top. Yeah. Yes, you, sir. Um, I would prefer if the, if the Tory party could take a leaf out of the Labour party and actually do a U-turn, particularly the Prime Minister, and make an apology to the gay family. To the Jai family, to the you're Jai talking family, about. Sorry, to, yes, to, to, to the Jai, Jai family. Brianna sorry. Jai, who, who was yes, murdered last year. They could, year. They, they, they could take a leaf from the Labour Party, the Prime Minister particularly, and show that he's a human being that understands people's feelings and their experiences and make a, 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 an immediate apology to the family. His behaviour is shocking. He's not infallible, he's a human being. Mm -hmm. And if an individual makes mistakes, the best thing they should do is put the hand up and say, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> 
man there in the grey sweater with the beard, I think. Yes. For us now, as the electorate, is it's who do we trust? Because, with all due respect, the Conservatives, like the gentleman rightly said about HS2, you've cut that short, and that was a complete waste of money in the end by the time it's actually going to get up and running. Labour, unfortunately, have got also skeletons in their closet, and I think the problem now is, as an electorate, who do we trust to manage the books? Because both parties have let us down. And what do you think of what Keir Starmer had to say today in terms of ditching this £28 billion a year? I'm the same as the gentleman just mentioned. I'd rather someone come out now before they're in power and say, you know what? Those numbers don't add up, we can't do this, and rather than say it now, then after they get into power, then let us down afterwards. I'd appreciate that honesty at the at the early stage, because that for me would give me more trust. But I think both parties really need to work hard about how they're coming up with their figures and managing the books. All right. So, Paddy, let me come to you. This is your debut on the programme. What do you think of what you've heard? Well, firstly, this is very daunting. <laughs> it's terrifying, in fact, but uh, lucky for me. Most people know I'm not here for me great political brain. But that, that didn't stop Boris Johnson, so we're all right. <laughs> um, it's, I think for me, like, James, you know, you saying to Wes that Keir Starmer is saying anything to get a vote is a bit rich coming from a Tory, let me tell you. <laughs> we, we're still waiting on the £350 million a week Boris Johnson promised us. It's coming, it's here, it's here. Whoa! It is. For the NHS, it's you're saying? Yeah, yeah for the NHS, it yeah. It is, Paddy, I'm afraid. Well, where is it? It's been put into the NHS. Why with is the, the NHS with on its other knees? 46.5 billion over the next three years. Why is the NHS on its knees if it's here? Why are it... they going on strike, nurses and doctors, if it's here? The NHS. Where is it? The NHS, in respect to the areas where we are, are delivering excellent care to local people in the town, Bury, the next town, the next town to you. We're delivering more elective <clears throat> procedures. We've got more doctors and nurses. Got record We're putting a record amount. Of, with record James. amount. Well, record, record waiting, waiting, record list, waiting list today for cancer in England, for example. Obviously, the situation with the pandemic has exact, has yeah. aggravated that, and there are other reasons. And the doctor strikes, unfortunately, do not help the situation. Well, let's let's get back to to to, uh, to, to the question from Kevin. Can we believe anything that Labour say or pleasure? That's what Kevin's asking. I mean, what what do you think about this this decision today? I see myself as a, a floating voter and I think this day and age, certainly the last five years, politics seems to have been led by personality. And if you look at Boris Johnson and how he did it to get into power, that's a prime example. And my worry with Keir Starmer, well, not a worry as such, is what he said today, and I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I almost kind of admire him for doing it now rather than after they get in power. Because after having the country decimated for the last 14 years by the Conservatives, I think they're an absolute shoe in Labour. I'll be flabbergasted if they don't get in. And I think him saying that, for me personally, I think, well, I'd hate for him to say that after he got right. in power. And then you feel... You feel even more let down. OK. But, but, the, but with regards to the climate crisis, sorry, I, I, most people, most taxpayers kind of do the bit, you know, you, you've got every coloured bin outside your house and you put solar panels on your roof and you do all the things you, you try and do to help. But at the end of the day, it's up to these lot, you know, governments around the world and big business. It's not on us. We do our bit. It's these lot who need to get their act together, really. OK. Daisy. We're facing a climate and ecological emergency and tackling that should be above party politics. It really, really should. I'm the vice chair of an all-party parliamentary group in Parliament that looks at the things we should be doing to tackle climate change because we simply can't afford any more climate failure. Now, it really worries me that we talk about the money that we need to spend on this as if it's a cost. Actually, it's an investment. It's an investment in our future. And if we get it right, then actually by investing in uh, sort of the green transition and, the, and, and climate issues, we can create jobs, we can create economic growth, we can reduce energy bills and we can save the planet. So do and you think Labour should have stuck the £28 billion? Look, Labour can speak for themselves. I haven't seen their plans. I don't know how they add up. But what I can say is that Liberal Democrats, which is the party that I'm here to represent this evening, have always led the way on climate and environmental issues. We were the very first party 
to call for a windfall tax on the big oil and gas companies. Why? Because we knew that if we could tax those people who are pulling in billions of pounds, we could help people with their energy bills, we could, um, we could double the warm homes discount, but also we wanted a proper windfall tax so we could invest in an emergency 10-year insulation programme to reduce people's energy bills, to make their homes warmer and to tackle this climate crisis. That's the kind of vision so that you, Liberal do Democrats you, have. Do you have a figure, as Liberal Democrats, that you would, would want to be spending every year? Not yet, but it will be in our manifesto and every single general election, the Liberal yeah. Democrats have a fully costed manifesto. You know, so the question is, with Labour ditching this uh, flagship promise to spend £28 billion a year, can we believe anything they say or pledge? That's Kevin's question. I think Kevin raises a really important point. I think it's all well and good, many of us saying, well, it is laudable that he has acknowledged that the economic situation has changed and that he's saying this before the election rather than after. But then you have to then ask the question, what are we voting for? Many of Keir Starmer's pledges that he staked his leadership on. He has U-turned on, on this. Many of his uh, shadow cabinet ministers were talking about this as recently as a few days ago. Well, Keir Starmer was talking about it on Tuesday, saying it was desperately needed. Exactly. And then on top of that, we had the uh, abolition of tuition fees that was dropped. He said he was going to nationalise lots of industries. That was also dropped. He said he was going to abolish the House of Lords, uh, abolish universal credit. So these are huge, potentially transformative policies that Keir Starmer has taken to the country and now abandoned. So, yes, I agree that many people uh, feel that the Tories have uh, not met expectations, but I don't necessarily think that that's a good enough reason to vote for another party. We need to see a genuinely transformative vision that people can believe in, not just having empty promises and effectively a conservative light. Man at the back. I agree with Anaya. Um... I can understand Labour's reticence um, in over-promising because that's partly what happened at the last election and was, the result uh, was obvious. Um, but what the country needs is a clear vision of how you're going to make people's lives better and a differentiation between yourselves and the Conservatives because otherwise people are only going to vote for Labour because they're not the Tories and not because they've got some vision for improving people's lives. OK. Young man here in the fr in, near the front, yeah. Yeah, I agree with what Daisy was saying about costing um, climate change measures. It's really tricky. And they say, like, a week is a long time in politics. But in the years and decades where the true impact of the climate crisis is going to be felt, it feels quite kind of easy for politicians to um, kick the can down the road, as it were, and kind of um, pick things that uh, to spend money on that seem almost more immediate. Um, but the more you kick that can down the road, um, money-wise, the more expensive it will be when you eventually get to it and say, actually, no, we should be spending money on this. And when it comes to other things like the NHS and the economy, obviously the climate catastrophe is going to catastrophe is going to have a massive impact on that. So I think, in terms of spending money on the climate uh, climate crisis now, I think it is much needed, and it's a, it's a shame to see the 28 billion get watered down. Really. Okay. Let's go back to Kevin because you asked this question. What do you think of what you're hearing? I think I, I don't don't really believe most politicians what they say. They they what, of any shade, any colour. Yes, right. particularly you know, the, Labour probably more than the Tories. But the Tories, as we've just heard most of the questions here today, sort of like they they've both done U-turns on on some of their major policies. So it's not just little side policies that they've done. They're, they're doing U-turns on their major policies. Which so I think the general public would would appreciate sort of if those. If the politicians could actually speak a bit of truth and actually sort of follow through their pledges and their promises and, and not just make them so that, you know, it, it, for us to vote on them. OK. Let's just come back to the question that, that you asked here in the front, which is, 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 is £5 billion a year going to be enough? I mean, just, just come back to this, words, because I don't want to be simplistic about this, but if £28 billion a year was desperately needed every year and that was going to be ramped up in the lifetime of the Parliament and Keir Starmer wants to get to the same point, but on a fifth of the money... To this woman's point here, how is that enough? Well, the, the £28 billion a year was about more than clean power by 2030, but that remains our commitment. And the announcements that we've made to get us there still stand. So it includes £8.3 billion so that we can set up Great British Energy, a publicly owned company that would invest in a clean homegrown power and make sure that as we invest, we get a stake in it. Because actually there's loads of publicly owned energy companies at work in this country. They're just publicly owned by other countries in Europe who benefit from our bills and the profits generated here. OK, but to, so to that woman's point, that? even though it's a fifth of the money, you're, you're saying 
I know we thought it should it needs to be five times bigger before. It's going to be a fifth of that now, and it's still going to be enough. Somehow. Yeah, and with £7.3 billion pounds for the, a national wealth fund, that will invest in British industries to make sure we've got electric vehicle manufacturing here, to make sure we save our steel industry and lo don't let it fall um, on its backside. A British jobs bonus of £500 million, pounds, so that as companies look yeah. to invest, we incentivise them to invest in those parts of the country that currently lag way behind London and the South East in terms of well-paid jobs. And the, and the final thing I'd say is this isn't all about public funding. A lot of what Labour's plan is geared towards is investing so that we unlock private investment too. And with our planning reforms, for example, there's a huge amount of investment that's being tied up by companies that want to build the new energy infrastructure in this country, but are held back by Britain's okay. outdated planning system. Right. So that's a big change we could deliver in Parliament okay. without costing us a penny and would let business get going. So don't think there's no change coming. There's change you can believe in. And whether it's this or whether it's our fully costed, fully plan funded plans for the National Health Service to deliver two million more appointments we, we a may, year. We or... may get on to all that, that but in this is a minute. The thing, but it's important, Fiona, because one thing I just... I know, but, so, I just, but so you don't end up trust, repeating yourself no, later I, in the okay, programme. Okay, that's okay, all I'm trying to say. Later, but the, just on this point of trust in politics, the reason I winced, actually, when Paddy said, oh, you, know, you, know, you guys are a shoo-in, we don't take any votes for granted. We've learned through bitter experience, actually, okay. as a Labour Party. And we know right. that it's not enough for people to reject the Tories. They need to positively vote for Labour. And we believe that's far more likely, and that you're far more likely to re-elect us if we have a manifesto that you can believe in, and that's why okay. we're making the hard choices now. All right. We may come back to this subject on, on other programmes, but I'm just going to let you know where we are next week before I take another question. So next week we're in Lancaster, and the week after that we are in Maidenhead in Berkshire. So if you'd like to come and be in the audience for either of those programmes, you live there or thereabouts, go to the Question Time website, follow the instructions there, and we would love to see you, Lancaster or Maidenhead. All right, let's take another question from Carla. Carla Spencer. Ah, there you are. Dentists say the NHS dentistry recovery plan is not worthy of the name. Is it time to invest in a pair of pliers? Oh, Carla. Oh, my goodness. Well, some people have been pulling their own teeth out with pairs of pliers, as, as we've seen. There was a huge, long uh, queue. I'm sure many of you saw it outside a, a new NHS dentist surgery in Bristol. People trying to get to see an NHS dentist, and the government has announced uh, the following day in, and uh, an NHS dentist recovery plan, which it's fair to say has not been well received by the British Dental Association. James, is it time to invest in a pair of pliers? Well, the plan that was announced this week is adding £200 million in spending. It's got a number of different um, st uh, strands to it. It's about uh, creating 2.5 million new appointments, which clearly is a good thing. Nobody can argue that that's not a good thing. It's creating a, a scheme called Smile for Life because there's been ample evidence which has been demonstrated for a long time that young people in this country, not all young people, but many young people's dental health is not where it needs to be. There's a lot of work gone into that, uh, certainly by... I can only speak locally in terms of my local council and local health services have really done a lot of work in the community. The rollout of family hubs has helped that, but more is needed because adverse dental care affects every part of a child's life. So I think that's something to be welcomed as well. So given this, this dentist recovery plan, the question, is it enough? For our audience here, if you were to win the next election, obviously you're behind in the polls at the moment, but yeah. if you were to win the next election, for Carla, if she wanted to sign on with an NHS dentist, how long would it take for you to sort dentistry out so that she could confidently find an NHS dentist? Well... Are we I, talking, what, a well, couple of years, one of, five well, years, ten if, years? If I, just in terms of the plan, and I think that's a very fair question. Well, in, let's, let's, let's hear it then. Let's hear the well, answer. in terms of the geography, so if you're in Cornwall, if you're in various parts of the country, especially rural areas, the answer to that question is it's very, very difficult. And the idea behind this plan is to invest money and to incentivise dentists to go into those areas to make sure that people do have access to NHS um, support. Yeah, but you must have some idea coming up this plan when you think it might work, otherwise it's just kind of finger-in-the-air stuff. So, say Carla lived in Cornwall. I know you don't, because you live around here. How soon, with your plan, would she expect to be able to see an NHS dentist? Well, if I judge that on the basis of what's... To register with one. If I, if I judge that on the basis of what's happening in Greater Manchester and Bury, where I am, there, there was certainly an issue a number of years ago in respect of access to GP... Uh, sorry, to, access to NHS dental appointments. There's been some brilliant work done with the, with the um, health and social care involved in Greater Manchester. 
We've been able to work with local dentists, we've been able to work with local practitioners. Yeah, but this is all before the dentist recovery. You've you got this new plan. Well, Fiona, but if people giving... might want to know when they think it might work, well, Fiona, I'm trying if to... it work at all. Fiona, if you want me to answer the question, I'm trying to give a practical example that we have got to... A... It, there are still challenges. We've got to a position in a relatively short period of time in Greater Manchester, before this extra money comes in, before this plan is in, to give more access to people for more uh, dental appointments. So my own personal experience... In Bury, in my particular area, I think great work has been done. I think this um, money, the extra money that's now, it's a total of over £3 billion going into dental services to support services. And I think it is going to really help. You know, we've got... But in terms of when it might really help, when might that I've be? Given you an, I've given you an example. No, but that's that, before in, in the plan. Example. OK, OK, I, we're not no, going to get anywhere. No. Wes? There are quite a few things the government announced this week which will make a difference and lots of them are things that Labour put forward as an emergency plan to try and uh, rescue uh, the state of dentistry. What was really missing though was the fundamental reform that's needed to the dentist's contract because over the last more than a decade now the gap between what dentists get through private practice and what they get from NHS work has widened to the point where loads of dentists are handing back their contract. And I went to that surgery down in Bristol the other morning and I saw the consequences of it. The dentist told me the reason they'd opened up wasn't because they had this great contract and the money there to deliver, but almost as an act of charity and kindness. We're here because we believe in this and we don't want to let the community down, but it was an act of kindness and we're not seeing that across the, across the rest of the country. And then you see the consequences with the queue outside. The woman who was almost in tears because she'd taken a couple of days off work to try and get her 14-year-old son signed up to, dentist, to, de to, to the dentist. Another woman who'd paid hundreds of pounds privately for a temporary filling and, and couldn't afford the bill of more than £1,000 to get all the work done. And so she was desperate for an NHS dentist. Well, and, let me ask you the same question then. For people so, here who want to be able to register with the NHS dentist and can't because... Uh, you know, for nine out of ten dentist surgeons, I think the, the fact is you, you actually can't, they're not taking on new adult NHS patients. If Labour were to get in power, how soon would people here be able to think I can register as a new patient with an NHS uh, dental surgery when I want to? Well, I, I want to make sure that people in every part of the country can get access to an NHS dentist, and that means for me, as I said this week, on the Monday after the general election. I will have, if we win the election, the British Dental Association in on the Monday. I know you said you'd sort out a contract new contract, but reform. how soon will people and, see and a I difference? And I hope if we can get if we can get there quickly enough that by the end of the first term of a Labour government, NHS dentistry would resemble more what it was before. But I make no bones about the fact that to get back to where we were, we're looking at a decade of national renewal to get the NHS back on track. That's what dentists are telling me too. But in the meantime, we've got to focus on those people who find it hardest to afford it. We've got to focus on kids because tooth decay is now the number one reason for hospital admission amongst children aged okay. 6 to 10. So we've got a lot of work to do. Rishi Sunak went to a, 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 a Cornwall, Cornish dentist today to showcase his new plan. Didn't bother to check before he went. They weren't taking on new patients. And when he got found out, they said... He said, oh, no, I wanted to demonstrate the scale of the problem. Well, who's been in power for the last 14 years? Okay, and let's he, and finally, audience. he Go says on, he's going to reform the dentist contract. That was in their manifesto in 2010, 2015, 2017, 2019. Why, James, should people trust you in 2024? And is this a pledge that you will stick to, Wes? <laughs> given, well, given that Keir Starmer has, 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 has ditched his £28 billion pledge, I mean... People could equally ask you, is that a pledge you're going to stick yeah, to? Con con de dentistry contract reform will be in Labour's manifesto and we will deliver on that pledge. And as you've seen, it will be in the manifesto because we've had the tyres kicked on it. And then, so, as I say, things that are no. now going in our manifesto well, are promises we've tested and promises we will keep. No, further back, the man in the glasses yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. I just want to say, I'm an NHS dentist. Oh, right, let's hear from you. You're an NHS right. dentist. Right. OK. Before you ask. You for me very quickly. Yes. <laughs> there he is, folks. If you want to register, he's sitting right there. <laughs> We're not taking on any new patients because since 2006 the contract has been capped. Once we reach how many pay people we're paid to see, we can't see no more. And in the last five years mainly, 50 phone calls a day are you taking on new NHS patients. And I was appalled at Victoria Atkins yesterday on Radio 4 saying that we'd rather do cosmetic dentistry because it pays more. That couldn't be further from the truth. We want to help people but we're not given the money 
to enable people to have the access to get the care that we want to give. Mm. So, yeah. so whoever gets in at the next election needs to give more money, needs to find more money for someone. We've got four, four million children that don't have access to a dentist, 40,000 a year put mm -hmm. to sleep for teeth out. It's a disgrace. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's all down to the Tories. Well, the government, you're, obviously, the Conservatives have been in power for 40 years. I should point out that the NHS, uh, the dentist contract was, was under the, the Blair government in 2006, so that was obviously something that came in under Labour. Paddy, is it time to invest in a pair of pliers? Funnily enough, my dad did that. What? He took his own teeth out because he couldn't get a dentist appointment, and this is a, a few years back. So I know that first hand. Um, but as someone, as a child, who was terrified of going to the dentist, I've got to congratulate the government because they've managed to get people queuing up at them. <laughs> people can't wait to get into the dentist now. Everyone, like, get me in there. But I, I spoke to a, a, a dentist today, funnily enough, and I'm, I'm glad you're here, Sue, because if I've got this wrong, and I, I often do get things wrong, you might be able to help me out here, but there's a thing called UDA, which is a unit of dental activity. So if you're an NHS dentist you'll get X amount of these UDAs. So let's say it's 10,000. So someone will come in for a scale and polish, that's one UDA. Someone will come in for a filling, that's 12. Someone a crown, that's 20. Now, that NHS dentist has to use up those UDAs. And if they don't use them up, they'll get penalised. And if they go above the UDA... Nodding get, from yeah, the NHS dentist They'll get penalised again. Um, so they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, and it, it, it's... It's almost becoming, you know, they do an amazing job, but you, you don't want to be going to a dentist who's doing target-based care as, a, as opposed to care-based care. I mean, I think the other issue is, is you get paid the same for one filling as for ten fillings. Yeah, so you, you know, so, you, so the incentive to spend less time on a patient. Yeah, you don't take one thing from Sainsbury's and or a trolley full and pay the same amount, but that's the system we work under. So if you need ten fillings... I get paid 30 quid. That takes me three or four hours' work. Mm. If I do one, I get 30 quid sort of thing. Oh, so oh, do, oh, it disincentivises you. Uh, do you have a... Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, because if I've come across as ignorant, but when you get your UDA, if it's 10,000, how do you feel... You know, if you, you care about your patients and you want to do see more patients, mm -hmm. that moral sort of quandary you get yourself in because if you if you see more than what you've been given how do you deal with that well if you see more you stop working because that, the, you don't get yeah. paid anymore above the contract and if mm. you see under you get clawed back the value and what victoria said yesterday about the money doesn't go into the ether it does because we then lose that work oh. okay in i um so i will in some ways, congratulate the government. At least, for example, regional inequality in this country is absolutely extraordinary. So I do think that it is good um, that the government is trying to incentivise um, public services to be spread across the country, at least more evenly. But I recognise that this isn't um, a long-term plan. And actually, the British Dentistry Association has said that since 2010, um, funding, spending on dentistry has uh, reduced by a billion pounds. I mean, that is extraordinary. Um, so I think that we need a long-term strategy. And there are just even simple things that could be done. So there is a cap on the amount of uh, dentistry students. And so each year we can only uh, train about a thousand people. And so I think that this could also contribute to staff shortages. I mean, at the end of the day, what we see with many other industries is that rather than training our own people, we often uh, recruit people from abroad, from countries that have already quite low uh, provision when it comes to their own public services. So I think one of the things that the government should look at, a very simple measure, is re removing the cap on uh, dentistry students. But also I think it's right to point out, um, as was mentioned, the contract changes, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. And this was introduced under the Blair government, but it has been a problem for dentists for several years now, but the government has done nothing about it. So whilst we train our dentists and that there should be an incentive to do in the public good it has to be economically viable for dentists and currently it's not Daisy. well um, whenever i go around the country talking to people i hear two things that people want gps and dentists gps and dentists <laughs> gps and dentists 
I can tell you that at the next general election, the Liberal Democrats will have incredibly bold promises on access to GPs and dentists. So um, the crazy thing about dentistry is, unlike in parts of the NHS where we don't have enough doctors and nurses and, you know, psychiatrists... So how would the Lib Dems get enough dentists? Well, let me just say, in, in other parts of the NHS, it takes a long time to recruit people. With dentistry, we've got thousands of dentists who want to do NHS work. This is the crazy thing. This could be fixed, actually, quite quickly if you had the political will and the investment. So there's two things we need to do. You actually need to eat this problem from both ends. You've got to start by having prevention, and that means actually giving the money to dentists to do preventative work. We were the first party, the Liberal Democrats, to call for supervised uh, tooth cleaning for very, very, very small children. Um, and we want to have an emergency registration scheme for all those people who are currently entitled to have a free checkup. These are pregnant mothers, children, uh, people on low incomes, but they can't get those checkups because there's no access. So we'd have an emergency scheme to do that, and that would sort out the prevention end. But at the same time, you have got people using pliers, using super glue to you know, put things back in their mouths. So you also need to have um, emergency access for urgent and emergency care. So you've got to eat this Where are the dentists going to come from doing that? Because the moment there aren't enough well, NHS dentists. Well, there are thousands of dentists in this country, and they are working privately because the NHS contract... You no, know, no, I hear what you say, but I'm if you quickly want to get this emergency care available, people have got to find so the dentist who are prepared to so do it. So there's two things you would do. Um, there's something called flexible commissioning, which means you can use the money in the UDAs differently, and there are some really exciting models around the country as to how that's happening. You could do that very, very quickly, and you could improve the way that that's done. One example, I've been to see a, a dentist where... Um, his entire practice cancelled everything they did for the nine days over half term, the two weekends and the five days, and all they did for nine days was check-ups on children. That's an amazing piece of work in that town. There are things that can be done with okay. flexible commissioning, but longer term, you have got to reform the contract. Okay. No more excuses. Right. It has to happen. There was actually right. an underspend as well. Last year, a £400 million underspend in the NHS dentistry budget. Imagine if that £400 million had been diverted into making sure those people who are currently okay. stopped from accessing dentistry, they can't afford it. Imagine if we put that okay. £400 million into dentistry... Well, hang on, we've got so the government here. The Why, was there 400, Why was there a £400 million underspend? The situation here is that we are addressing a problem with the plan that we have. There's more money going in. There is more money in terms of tackling why, regional why inequalities. Was there, was it just, why was there £400 million underspent? We are spending the money as part of this plan to address the underlying problems. That's why the plan has been announced okay. this week. Um, and that's why we are doing, try, uh, trying our very, very best to address the issues. And there is clearly an issue with the, with okay. the uh, contract. It's been announced oh. this week because it's an election round the corner. That's why you've announced it. OK, <laughs> let's move on. Let's take another question from Bridget. Bridget Buckley. Should we put a legal age limit on smartphones to protect our young people from new technologies? So, Bridget, I imagine you're asking this question because the, the mother of uh, Brianna Jai, who was murdered last year, um, she was 16, she was murdered by two 15-year-olds. Uh, her mother, Esther, has called for children under 16 to be stopped from having access to social media apps. She wants to have kind of children's phones, mm. if you like. Yes. Um, Daisy. First of all, can I say my, my heart goes out to Brianna's mother and father and her friends and family. They have conducted themselves with the most extraordinary dignity and compassion. I have to say I was incredibly moved by her interview at the weekend and my heart really, really does go out to them at this time. Um, this issue is really complex. The, uh, the online sphere is like the Wild West. And I think we can all see the damage it's doing to young people. And but is she on to something? Because it, it, the, way, the way she talks about it, she says it could be so simple. Yeah. You could have, you know, basically like bricks, you know, that, that, that under-16s could have, and they wouldn't be able to go on social media apps, and that would, at least until they're 16, prevent them from seeing some of the, 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 the worst things on um, social media. I am incredibly open-minded and I'm open to hearing any suggestion that could work to make the online safe spacer for, uh, safer for children. I really am. We have got to act in this space. The government has been too slow. I think parliamentarians haven't got to grips with it fast enough collectively on a cross-party basis. And I think the tech companies themselves have been slow. I think one of my concerns with this specific proposal is I just don't know whether it would work or not. So in 2017... Um, there was the introduction of something called the um, uh, age bans. So, you know, you can only access content online if you're this age, you can only access this content if you're this age, you can only access this content if you're this age. Um, and it didn't work. 
it wasn't enforceable. And actually, when we passed the online safety bill last year, those particular that use of age bans was repealed because it wasn't working. And so um, I am open to ideas. I'm not sure that this particular idea would work. What, what I would say is that the NSPCC, which is the charity supporting uh, children, has said that they would like to see an independent children's uh, online safety advocate who would advocate for safety measures that could be introduced. And I okay. think that's a fantastic idea and one that certainly I'm very, very willing to support. Um, Paddy, <laughs> should children under 16 be stopped from having access to social media apps? I think, listen, if social media was gone tomorrow, I, I wouldn't lose a wink of sleep, to be honest. But it's here to stay. So I think we've got to better understand it. And the and kids at school need to be educated on it. But I, I'm a big believer, rightly or wrongly, I know there's freedom of speech and everything else, but why is there no ID verification when you're signing up to something like Twitter or X, whatever it's called now. But anyone can go on there. Like, all these chat sites, there's literally... It's like the Wild West. There's no there's no verification on there. So, you know, it's... it's for a paedophile, you know, it's so easy to get in touch with kids. And as a parent of three children who... Most parents are constantly worrying about the kids. I find myself, you know, if they're on the computers or on their iPads and looking at stuff, I'm constantly peering over the shoulder. I don't want to do that, you know, but I think the kids need educating at school about it and parents need educating. You know, someone mentioned the other day, to, uh, uh, do you know what a snap streak is? I've never heard of it, you know? So he's like, and I consider myself pretty all right with that kind of stuff, so... I, I, I mean, is it realistic, do you think, what, what Esther is calling for? And it's completely understandable why she is calling for it for children under 16 to be stopped from having access to social media apps? Or do you think that genie is out of the bottle now and it's just uh, too late? No, I, I, I think she's, she's bang on calling for it. You know, and how, how those parents are handling the death of their daughter is admirable. And to come out and do that, to try and help other parents and their children stay safe, I'm all for it. And I? So I think it is... In hugely understandable um, why this discussion has, has taken place. And I do think that there is some evidence to show, I think a social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, did demonstrate that actually when social media and smartphones were introduced, it strongly does correlate um, with a significant decline in mental health for young people, particularly young girls. So I do think it is an important conversation to be had. But I think Paddy's absolutely right in terms of empowering parents to be much more technology literate. So there are actually things that parents can already do, such as filtering um, the internet. And I think there are conversations to be had about age verification and so on. So I don't necessarily think the solution is banning things. I do worry increasingly that um, banning uh, access to smartphones or social media is becoming a kind of panacea for a whole range of issues. I've heard politicians talk about when it comes to knife crime and serious youth violence, to uh, uh, remove access to violent videos on, on, online, but also we talk about this when it comes to Islamist extremism, if only we stopped having access to the internet. Um, so I think that it is um, a much deeper kind of social problem what draws young people into extremist and dangerous ideologies. And whilst I think we'd all be better off if we probably spent less time on our smartphones and social media, I don't necessarily think it is the uh, be-all and end-all for tackling this social problem. Okay. Woman here, young woman in the front. I do agree with there being restrictions on social media and the ages that can reach them. But I personally think part of the issue is the lack of alternatives with younger people. So again, with knife crime events, I've attended quite a few and I'm a deputy youth assistant. So what I'm seeing with young people is that they don't have social communities. They don't have places outside of school that they can go to that safeguarded and protected that they can interact with, which is why social media is such a crush clutch because there are less of those um, things there and in Nottingham specifically the local libraries are being defunded there aren't those places that young people can access in a safe environment mm. so that they aren't experiencing so much social media. So would you, as because you're you know considerably younger than anyone else here on the panel, would you would you support this idea? <laughs> Thanks, Wes. Would you support this idea of, of banning social media apps on, on, on phones with I think children under 16? a balance because what you don't want to do is completely ostracize them from 
the rest of the peers who will be able to do it. And technology is just growing infinitely. So it will be the future inevitably in and some, you've got to learn if not how most degrees. So we do need to, like Paddy said, get education in there so we can utilize it effectively. But I do think being introduced to it so early should be restricted. Okay, okay. Um, man there in the glasses there, in the middle, yeah. Teenagers are always going to be using social media and social media sites are supposed to have safety checks on them and have better safeguards on um, teenagers who are under 18. Should um, the government um, hold these social media sites to account and, and make sure they enact these safety checks? Because we're seeing time and time again the social media is failing to do this. OK, I'll come to you on that. Let me just hear another. Yes, the man slightly further back in the blue check shirt. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with Paddy quite a lot in what he said. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of honesty there. Um, but the fundamental problem with a lot of the issues we've heard tonight all comes down to the root cause. So the root cause that we have problems with phones, in my opinion, is that we as a society are not educating our children correctly in the use of these phones and applications, and we're not parenting correctly. Um, Father of three, father of four. You know, I want to make sure my children are set up for life, so I'm trying to teach them the right things. Then we come back to uh, the Liberal Democrat lady, who earlier on stated, environment, really important, it doesn't come down to politics. And then in the next breath was then coming up with a political statement, which just contradicts it. The root cause is that everything that's being discussed, you know, always revolves back to, uh, you know, a particular organisation's direction of travel. Um, and then the third thing with dentistry, that we've talked about tonight, again, comes back to, well, what's the root cause of that? You know, excuse the pun with <laughs> teeth roots. But ultimately, you know, are we educating children and families how to do the basics well, and brush as their... parents, you mean? As, as parents and brush right. their okay. teeth correctly. Well, so, James, you, you've, you've talked about parents um, uh, recently. You were saying that um, you thought certainly a lot of the problem with, with kids in, in your neck of the woods, in Bury North, was, well, you know, with... with children who are struggling or troubled children was, was down to crap parents. So, are you agreeing with the man there? Well, I think in terms of answering the question, I agree with the lady at the front in respect to this. And I also agree with Paddy. On an individual basis, I'm sorry just to bring it back to, to an individual basis, I do not like social media. I don't like these apps in any way, shape or form. That may, I may be completely out of touch with reality as to where we are. I have two sons um, and it... Uh, I have to echo what Paddy was saying. It frightens me in terms of what they are seeing and what they are doing. On a very practical level, for both of them, actually, they do a lot of their work on, on a, an iPad or a, a thing, and they actually have apps now which help them to do their work, which are part of their educational process. And I think, to a certain extent, that the genie is out of the bag in terms of social media, and the question, therefore, more... And I fully understand how... how what, Esther, how, I... I I would certainly, if I was in her position, I, I feel and I'm not going to put myself call for this to happen. So and could, I think could this, would sorry. I mean, w is this something the government would do then? You know, you say you know, it frightens you, you're worried for your own children. Well, you're I, saying parents need to educate their children more. She's calling something very specific, which is for children under 16 to be stopped from having access to social media apps. We, could the government do that? Would you like? I to think. Do that? Well, if I, I'm speaking as, I'm a, as a father here, I'll come on to the government in just one second. I think that the issue is, I'm a member of the Home Affairs and Justice Select Committee, and one of, the, one of the issues that we have in terms of crime is online crime. It is out of control, how we control the use of personal information, which is costing billions in terms of fraud and all sorts okay, of things. But other very things. specifically, because we could talk about all sorts of online okay. crime. This is a really specific I thing think, that Esther Jai is asking I think, for. I think that um, it is... We're in a position now where we have to have a mix. I don't think it is... Uh, um, realistic to think we can ban okay. all apps for all, right. all under 16. Right, but I think a lot more work needs to be done with the social media platforms to protect our young children. Is this something a Labour government would do? Yeah, well, for, firstly, I, I mean, I agree with um, Daisy that the way that Esther Jai has conducted herself in the wake of the most horrific tragedy has been remarkable. And uh, I think we owe it to her to come up with some serious answers, including her other big call, which was for wellbeing support in school. And we've got a commitment to make sure we've got mental health support in every primary and secondary school in the country. But in terms I think of the this question generation have it harder than ever. Just, in... Yeah, so on, on the under-16 ban, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure this is workable. But I'm sort of, in, sort of in the same sort of space as Daisy on this. And the other thing I'd just say is this. And wh why, do some... why do you think it's not well, workable? Because 
Firstly, I think we underestimate this generation of young people in terms of their tech savviness. I think they find any workaround and are very good at it. The other thing uh, I'd just say as well is that I think it's partly part of our responsibility of adults, as with any new thing that young people are going to encounter as they grow up, to kind of support them through that process rather than block them off and say, wait until you're 16. I think it's about bringing people into um, the online world in a safe way. And I just wondered out of interest, if, for example, because I, I think politics can solve lots of problems, but we can't necessarily solve every problem, and that's partly about, you know, to some of the comments in the audience, if, for example, the technology companies said, we're going to develop a smartphone designed specifically for under-16s, and we said, OK, well, we'll have that on the market for under-16s, and it's got safety protections and controls for under-16s, how many of you would buy them for your kids and be happy with them having something like that as opposed to a general mobile phone? How many people, if you would do that, put your hand up. I'm just curious. I'd buy one. Because I just think, like, there are some problems that we can solve and the support we can put in place and the laws we can but put in place. The issue surely is if, if that's the only thing available, because if there are other no, phones think, available, the, the kids would go, no, no, I want I, the other type. I genuinely think there's an opportunity here for some of the mobile phone companies and some of the big tech companies to actually come up with a product that would support kids safely give parents more confidence and give young people okay. that opportunity to start right. learning and growing in a okay. safe way online with a device okay. specifically designed for young people. And I think they should look at it. Sorry, I'm going to... Yeah. Just, what you were saying about kids being tech savvy, I get that, uh, Wes, but there's a lot of kids out there who are vulnerable as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so it's... That a statement like that is OK, but... It, it doesn't wash, really. Well, because the other thing is I wouldn't want kids banned, for example, we've dis discussed this before, but banning kids having mobile phones. I think most parents are now glad that kids okay. have the mobile right. phone on the way to and from school. But I just wonder whether there's a product that could come onto yeah, the market that, that would actually make it a lot safer and give parents that confidence. I've got very little time, but I want to squeeze in this last question because quite a few people asked about it from Ella Millett. Ella. Um, following the devastating substance attack in Clapham last week, how can the government stop sex offenders like Abdul Azadi being granted asylum status? Right, so you'll be familiar with this story. It's a horrific attack on a woman and her two children. It's a corrosive chemical. Uh, Azadi arrived by uh, lorry in the UK in 2016. He tried twice to get um, asylum here. First two applications were refused. His third one was accepted, even though he had been convicted of sexual assault and indecent exposure, and he'd been on the sex offenders register as well. How did that happen, James? Well, it's a legal process, first of all. Um, I'll come on to what the government, the legislative process in respect of that. It does beg the belief, but I can't talk in respect of individual cases to listen to what Fiona's just said, that there has been two uh, refusals and then there's suddenly a Damascene conversion to Christianity and that's been accepted. Well, he, actually, think... he said he converted Christianity for the second application as well. That one was turned down. Well, that down, makes it even worse. And then, then the third the one case. was accepted. I think, I'll, I'll, I, I think there are some questions regarding the evidence that he's put before tribunals and courts in respect of these conversions and perhaps we need to look at that and perhaps need, questions need to be asked in respect of but that. But he was a sex offender. That's the, that's the point Ella's making. How, how, how can the government stop sex offenders like him being granted asylum status? Well, at this moment in time, for sex offenders to, well, for any type of offender to be automatically deported from the country, they have to receive a certain sentence. Now, my understanding in this case, Fiona, is that for very serious sexual offences, I understand it may well have been a non custodial sentence. It was. Uh, in respect of that, and that was the reason why it happened. If it, if it had hit a certain custodial period, then he would have been deported automatically. I Do think... you think that should change? I think there is definitely, as, as I say, I think there's definitely, um, we have to respond to these horrific cases and we have right. to look to see if things can be better and the law can be changed. So I think it's a very, very um, proper question to ask and a very strong challenge to the government. I'm sorry to say, we've only got about five minutes left, so you're going to have to be reasonably brief. Inaya. Well, I think for many people it encapsulates exactly what the problem is with our broken asylum system, that somebody was able to come to this country illegally, um, apply, have his application rejected twice and then probably through legal aid and other funding by the taxpayer who was able to appeal and a sex offender someone that is dangerous and harmful to people in this country was then eventually granted asylum and then went on to commit a horrific act on a woman uh, and her child and actually one of the things that was most worrying to me about it after that happened politicians from both sides of the political spectrum went on television and rather than ask the right questions about how this person was able to come into this country, who signed off on that decision, they ended up talking about microaggressions. 
You know, that, that, that's not the serious discussion. What do you mean, talking about microaggressions? Well, they were on Newsnight talking about the fact that um, uh, microaggressions against women are the things that we need to be talking about in relation well, this to this is particular... Certainly hardly a microaggression. Well, exactly. Well, this is exactly my point. And I think that we need to have a serious conversation in this country about how certain people are seemingly abusing our system, exploiting our generosity, and are being able to commit heinous acts and we cannot remove them. I think that is an absolute disgrace and that is putting people in this country in serious danger. Yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one, isn't it, Daisy? Because if he came from Afghanistan, it's quite possible that you couldn't deport him back there anyway. Uh, not now, and possibly at the time. So, okay, so then, what, then what should happen? Run. Well, let me just say, this was a horrific attack. It was horrific and it was quite startling. You know, as a woman, when we see these kind of attacks, they alarm all of us, right? Um, because it appears, we don't know, but it appears that it was a deliberate attack um, on a woman. Yeah. Um, and, and that is very scary. There are lots of questions, lots of serious questions that have to be asked about this case. And it worries me that we're focusing on some of the questions, but not all of them. So first of all, as I understand it, the uh, sentencing that, this, that he was given was less than 12 months. Right? The Home Office guidance is that if you're given a sentence longer than 12 months, then you are deported, but it was a sentence less than 12 months. So there's a question there, which is about our sentencing rules, not about the assignments, it's about our sentencing rules. Then he was being supervised uh, for two years, um, and during that time, you would hope that somebody would be rehabilitated, but clearly he wasn't. So there are serious questions to ask about probation and about our criminal justice system as well. And then there's a third question about the appeal. We're told that apparently there was a letter from a priest saying that he had uh, converted. We have no idea whether the judge in that case actually considered that letter to be the critical factor or whether it was dismissed. We don't know. What worries me is that there are serious questions to be asked about sentencing, probation, all the rest all right. of it, and the government seems to be attacking the church rather than taking oh, responsibility yeah. for the so Home I've got, Office. I've got a couple of minutes left, Daisy, forgive me. A couple of minutes left, Daisy, I have to agree. Yeah, I was going to say, look, mindful of time, we need tougher laws and they need to be enforced robustly. If you're a sex offender, you should not be able to use our asylum rules to make, your, to make Britain your home. You should not be welcome so here. So, if it's given that he was from Afghanistan, is, would Labour then deport look, him back look, to well, Afghanistan? I, I, think, I think we just need to have an honest, open that, conversation that, as a country about this. Is that kind of detail it will come down to? Well, I'm to. sorry, but why does he deserve to be here rather than Afghanistan if those are the sorts of crimes he commits? And the final thing I'd just say, as an Anglican, <laughs> is... I am fed up with the government blaming other people for their mistakes as if, as if it's the Archbishop of Canterbury dishing out visas and overseeing the system. And, you know, this has happened time and time again with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Church of England. We don't do this to other faith leaders. The Conservatives accusing of virtue signalling. Well, he's the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's literally his job to signal virtue. But don't blame the Church for the failings of this government and the failures of our immigration system. It's a disgrace. Paddy, we've only got about a minute left, I'm afraid. I echo what Wes has said, really. I, I, I think tougher punishment for that kind of crime. But I also feel as though everything I've seen on the news with regards to that, I, I, I do feel as though women are being let down mm. when it comes to the law as well. Because, yeah. you know, if so, someone uh, goes to the police, uh, with you know, saying they've been raped, from going to the police to it actually... If it does get to court and they do get tried, you're talking years. Years. It's ridiculous. So that, whoever's in the next government, 100% he's looking at. Right, OK. <laughs> we are out of time, I'm afraid. James, forgive me. We are out of time. We could have talked a lot longer about that. Forgive me for having to rush it, but I wanted to get it in because a number of you had, had raised that. Our hour is up. I just want to um, thank the people who supplied these photographs here very kindly, which are Carol Russell, Robin Macy and Brian Harrison. Thank you all very much for those. We're in Lancaster next week, and after that, we're in Maidenhead. So if you want to come and be part of the programme, go to the Question Time website. But for now, from Nottingham, from our panel, from our audience here, bye-bye. <laughs>